Hello there, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, all of whom are loved and welcome in this space. And before I get any more into this intro, I just want to say, if that annoys you, please feel free to click off the video, um, fuck off at your nearest convenience, and we'll continue with the show. Uh, I'm your co- uh, I'm your host. I'm your host, Charlie Ashby, and joining me as always is Master Assassin Claire Stribling. Master Assassin, I love that. Thank you. Yes, I am. Of course. Deadly. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. You know, getting by. Enjoying the first three episodes of Andor. How are you doing, Charlie? Yeah, well, I, again, just blown away by this amazing little treat that we've been given as Star Wars fans. It feels like it's been a while since we've, since we've gotten anything very Marvel out in a good way, but nice to dive back into the, um, the beautiful world of Andor, particularly this character, particularly this sort of era and this sort of storytelling we're getting with him. Because, you know me, I love Rogue One. I love that world. I love that character. I love that, you know, that weird gray area that we seem to be delving into in this little bit of the pocket of this galaxy. So very, very hyped, very excited. Um, and I'm glad that we don't have to do this by ourselves, Claire. I am as well. Like, you're great and all, but I'm kind of sick of just talking to you. <laughs> With love. Okay. That, that wasn't in the script. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> okay. Discussing this week's episode with us is a special guest. He's the host of Bogus Cantina podcast and the best fan a drunken podcast host could ask for walking home. It's Sean Room. Hey, everybody. <laughs> That's the most accurate introduction, though, truly. The, oh, my the, gosh. The one person you want in the Marriott Hotel bar when you need some assistance home. I'm looking at you, Charlie Ashby, because, yeah, that's what Sean was for us. And I don't know that I should have been in that state, to be honest. I was in my own <laughs> state. I was just not. I hadn't spent as much time in the bar as you guys had. <laughs> yeah, we've been there a while. <laughs> yeah, so for those who don't know the story, at Celebration, we did our, our, you know, I'd say annual, but it's not every year. But every time we have a Celebration, we have a, an Imperial Senate podcast party, live podcast event. And we try to get as drunk as possible. And this time was very interesting uh, because... Last year, or the last celebration in Chicago, we had the last night, which was pretty great, pretty fun. We got to bump into some people, do a live show, but it was the last night. Most people had either left or were, you know, couldn't go crazy. This time we decided to do it midway, I believe, midway. And the, I'm, I'll crazy. be honest, it all blurs we together. Had a good time. I think it was Saturday. It was, it was the night of. It was the night of Mosh. I think it was Saturday. Yeah. Yes, and Mosh Eisley was going on. Obviously, people were going out for that. We had uh, Scotty Jarrow show up in full kiss regalia. Amazing. Which is just incredible. Drunk as a skunk. We had a lot of fun. Rest as yeah. Paul Stanley. Amazing. You know it's a good party when Ash Crossan shows up and buys you shots, you know. Immediately. It was, it was Daniel Kennedy's birthday, too. <laughs> it's the first thing. It was. Yeah. He was, he, yeah, because yeah, they they came by Mosh, so I got to that's the first time I ever met Ash, and just said hi for a minute, went on to do all that partying. But that was that the same night that you guys recorded your your After Dark <laughs> interview oh, yeah. podcast episode where you just walked up to everybody. That I listened to that a few weeks <laughs> after that. When you guys were out. And my, I was driving and I like was in stitches. It was. Oh, very representative of the night, <laughs> was... to be fair. It was very representative <laughs> of what was going on. <laughs> it's horrifying, like, when it's you have very that, much those recorded like moments. Watching... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, it was hor it's horrifying yeah. to it's see very much like stuff. Game of No, it's... <laughs> oh, I think you're a bit delayed, Claire. Am I delayed? I think you're delayed. <laughs> I don't think I am. 
we'll, we'll find see out. Sean. Sean, can you hear me? Sean, the, what's the verdict on this? I, one of you guys is delayed. I really don't know which one, though, because I think it must be Charlie. It's coming through for Charlie later. Oh. Oh, Damn it. we're trying to blame me. Maybe the I see how it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Likely story. I think it's a you problem, Charlie. Well, you know what I think about that? You'll find out in about five minutes. Uh, let's see if this works. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, well. That was fun. It just needed to be Uh, called out in order to sort itself out. Yeah, I need to be taken down the peg, clearly. Um, (laughs) Judging by that episode, you certainly did. (laughs) That episode, I was trying to explain it. It's a bit like Dante's Inferno. It just keeps going and going (laughs) deeper into the depths of hell. To the point where Um, there's a moment where... uh, (laughs) <laughs> uh, Scotty takes my phone and just starts doing a monologue into the phone and I remember not knowing what he was talking about and thinking I should probably take this back and then I was listening to back to some of the in- interviews I gave if it, if it could be called that quite frankly, terrible and yeah one episode, that's on the podcast feed if you want to listen to it, we won't talk too much about that today because we well, have I'll just say that to talk about when i came when i came back i'll say one more thing is that when i ran into you guys this was well after you had finished recording those those interviews <laughs> oh no so it was like that <laughs> but a little further on in the night and then we had like i don't know a half mile walk home at least maybe closer to a mile it was a little a little ways it was fun though it's interesting because the first time we met you sean and it's it was one a couple of those days times earlier, where... wasn't it? Or was it that exact Claire, day? I met you, Claire, yeah. on the floor a few days earlier. That's right. See, I knew him first. Thank you very much. Well, it's the first time I've met Sean. It was nice to have like a fan of the show. It's not nice when you can't remember walking home with them. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> There's, it's just, it's just certain phrases that you hear that you don't. <laughs> particularly like to hear or what would like to hear um one of the phrases i heard was you have seen throwing stickers and running after anti <laughs> uh, <laughs> not quite what i like to remember but Amazing. That's what oh we do. god it was a fun night it was, a it was fun great night. we have to do more of that um speaking of what's like i can't I'll cut that speaking of something else that's great and or three episode premiere. Sean, what did you think about these three episodes? Um, I thought they were great. I thought, you know, there's a lot been said, a lot of, you know, painting with a wide brush, talking about what the show is. It's dark, it's gritty, but it's more than that. It is different from other Star Wars stories that we've been told in its tone. I think that's pretty evident from, you know, even the first few scenes. But I don't know. It's something that we've never gotten before. It's a more focused. We get to see these people in their lives, how they're living, um, sort of not the galactic heroes in this moment. This not this big Hollywood blockbuster type story that they're telling. And so it gives you time to like produce an incredible script and to delve deeper into these characters. And yeah, I don't know. I'm loving it. I'm loving everything from acting and writing to the set design and how it looks so i loved it i stayed up <laughs> until way too early in the morning watching it when it premiered and uh yeah claire what about you i i really 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 loved it as well i think the thing about this is i'm glad that they released the first three episodes together um mm-hmm. they definitely needed to do that because it feels like Uh, earlier in the week, I I had seen some quote from Diego Luna being like, it plays like a movie, watch them all together. Uh, He's right. And it was a very good movie. But, you know, sometimes the first act of a movie is, you know, you'll see in my reaction video, it's more so of me just taking in information and getting to know who we are, where we're going. Um, That being said, every single character that they've introduced 
um, it, everybody's fascinating and everybody has different, it, they've, this story is very clearly character focused and their relationships with each other, their relationships with the world, their point of view and how everybody is doing the right thing in their mind. And we've got very, we've got conflicting ideals here, but you know, a bunch of people that it, I'm just fascinated. I'm fascinated because everybody wants is like doing the right thing in their eyes and it's such a different set of outlooks in this weird landscape in this in between period um i love the the primor security that that addition i'm fascinated with where they fall in the empire's hierarchy i'm fascinated in potentially cosplaying one of those like armored uniforms because first of all they're bears colors and second of all they're badass um, and I'm just fascinated where everything fits in the grand scheme of things and where they all fit. Um, shout out to Imperial Mining Disasters. Let's go. No views of the Imperial Senate yet, but they're coming. We're going to get our cameo here soon. Um, but yeah, I'm loving where we're going. It was beautiful how they paralleled the story of him going off into the unknown and being rescued from this planet that was doomed to be uninhabited or uninhabitable yeah is that the word something like that and how paralleling it with him on his journey off into the rebellion beautiful magnificent gorgeous acting gorgeous people um b b2 emo our little emo boy and vetch and that's all i have to say vetch. On yeah, a character that I felt um, reflected in for the first time. Um, That's very good. To, yeah, the, <laughs> the voice. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> what did you want? What did um, I do? He, do <laughs> <laughs> he just said it's I had me. to stand here. <laughs> He's so good. Um, he was so. I, I found out that like Ian Ian White, who plays that character played like the same alien species in one of the sequel movies. I read that somewhere today. Ooh. He is, oh, is the, it the species. one from <laughs> No, I was gonna say is it the one from Seven? But it might not be. I was thinking it might He's be part like, of the resistance guy. or something. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely looked familiar, the species. Mm -hmm. It was just really cool to see them sort of blend in. Uh B2 Emo, a character that I really enjoyed, but I've now like my appreciation has grown even more so because <laughs> I found out a really pointless fact, which is that the character B2 Emo's voice is played by if I double check this, Dave Chapman, who is an actor in the UK, who in the UK there's this like really big cult show called Dick and Dom in the bungalow. And it's like this live show that happened every week, and you'd have like they play cartoons and stuff, but they'd have these kids on and they'd like do like crazy stuff, like stuff, throw cuss to their people and like whatever. But they had those like weird characters, and they had that, these like young comedians and stuff come in and do this like really ridiculous comedy. Like, if you look back, you're like, Jesus, how they get away with that. Um, and there's this really specific bit that always stuck out to me. And it's, if you watch it, it's so ridiculous. And it's, clearly how it influenced my sense of humor but there's this weird scene where dave chapman plays this cat who's like a northern cat so talks with proper that northern accent and he he would just cut, show up every week and then they'd like hit him around the head but one week oh. he shows up and um <laughs> he starts singing it he out of nowhere starts singing a song about a very specific town called Stoke on Trent, <laughs> just like a, the most boring place you can think of. He sang a song about it, and you can just see the two hosts not knowing that this was going to happen, just like pissing themselves laughing. And last night I looked at the clip again, and it just it just hit me in the heart because like that is B two emo, <laughs> like the past and the and the present collided in a weird sort of way that just made me very happy, and so I was very happy about that. And that's why I like to end uh, Andor. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> that's specific. That's it. That's, that's, my that's your analysis. Full review. <laughs> that's my full review. Uh, check me out on uh, no. 
I really enjoy that. Um, you know that my favorite period is obviously this in between between episode three and four. I really love delving into not only the, the you know, like I love delving into the, the force aspects with like Obi Wan and the whole of that, of that show and dealing with the galaxy and the Jedi and how people are hiding away and stuff. But I also really enjoy the everything about this era. I mean, the specifics, like you were saying, the we get to see for the first time the sort of politicking around corporations in the prequels but for the for the original trilogy era and that's very interesting the idea that you know it, it's, it's not even that it's not even that big of a surprise but just seeing like this this army for a practically like a business was very disturbing and then you remember of course the trade federation had their own army this is something that's in the galaxy and it's like embedded in there and it's managed to continue while the empire is like spreading across the galaxy and willing to just not care about things. The idea that they're like, oh, well, it's the status quo, but we've got to be a little bit careful. Like, yeah, we've got a brothel. We shouldn't really have it. And it's a pretty good one. We spent a lot of money on this brothel. So don't, you know, don't, don't bring that into it. Well, they just got murdered. It's fine. I, I love that detail. That, of like them. Yeah. Ooh. And that it, whole it, monologue it, that that chief, inspector gave it's not really i guess a monologue it's him just talking to cyril about hey drop this man that delivery of that whole thing was just like apex he was so Ooh. good so good he's like are you understanding what i'm telling you <laughs> like get this out of here don't reference the the what was it what did he call it? like the leisure zone yeah <laughs> i guess yeah. it's like their red light district of, of <laughs> Milana one um which looked incredible, by the way. I mean, Didn't just it? that one like stairwell with the domed out windows. With How do I get a, a position as a as a bubble dancer in the leisure zone? Do one of these, yeah. you know? It felt very much like, yeah, the Red Light District in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Like, people doing stuff in those bubbles. You know what I mean? Um, you know, right? I love it. <laughs> I'd love to get to Milano 1. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I thought it was a really. I love the planets. I love the thing that I, the thing that makes people angry. That obviously I love is the Rogue One text. So when I saw that show yes. up again, I was like, yes, um, we're back. People have been talking. People have been talking about the BBY as well being put on screen, and mm -hmm. I love it. That's just cool. I mean, it's obviously like Andor has no idea what BBY means. That's not any metric that he uses because it hasn't happened. But it's cool that they're doing that for people who, you know, geeks like us who will point it out to and explain it to their parents and all that. So. That's 100% it. When I saw that come up, I'm like, hey, I, Dad, I know you're going to watch this later today. BBY stands for Before the Battle of Yavin. The Battle of Yavin yeah. was the first movie <laughs> at the end with the Death Star go boom. Okay, continue watching, Dad. <laughs> it, it's funny because I love the debate around it. One, I love it because it's, no, we used to sing it because I think it's usually five BBY. I think they changed it to the number afterwards, right? Like it's BBY five. Am I right or wrong? Mm, I don't, I think it was. I think it was normal. I was think it, it was normal. I'm gonna have a double check. You keep you keep talking. <laughs> I'll make sure okay. I'm not giving fake news out. But yeah, I will say that I loved um, going off of what you said about that inspector. The uh, whatever the official, I don't remember his official title. Yeah. I'm really bad with names. I will finally remember everybody's names by the end of the series. Um, Just in time. Exactly. And like, a <laughs> good thing I'll be talking about it this entire time. I've, I've literally pulled up IMDB so I can reference, his, reference names. Um, but everything that you needed to know to set up Cyril's motivation who he is as a person, what drives him. All that you needed to know was watching him be silent during that monologue. That's all yeah. you needed to know. Brilliant BBY writing. Five. Is it BBY5? I... Fake fan over here. Clearly, I'm not paying attention. Fake but fan. Interesting. It's cool because I, I think they also said that we're going to get to meet Cyril's mother at some point mm. during the show. I think I read that in a, or listened to it in an interview with um, the actor who plays Cyril. And Kyle Soler. 
Solar? Kyle Solar, yes. Is that right? Solar, Solar. Solar. I don't know. Some somehow more of a Star Wars name than his Star Wars name. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, it doesn't get much more Star Wars than Tim with <laughs> with two oh. M's. Yes, Tim. <laughs> well, we'll get to Tim. Um, but Ooh, Timmy boy. Like I do think, like okay, this guy clearly Cyril is passionate about doing this work, which is like okay. If, if that's what you want to be passionate about, but clearly he's got like some sort of issue. I don't, he's been compared to someone or been mm -hmm. told that he's in, he's never going to achieve anything. Or so he's got like this need to overachieve and impress someone. I don't know who that is. I don't know if it's just himself. I think it's probably having to do with his past that I hope we get to learn more about, but mm -hmm. yeah, he's, he just stands there and he's like, I'm trying to understand why you're telling me to drop this, but I don't want to. And it's, it's interesting very... to see him around everybody else we meet through those three episodes. When you see him, because he's clearly in some sort of officer role, you see him in front of the soldiers, you know, the footmen. See the dynamic there. <laughs> you see him you just where he fits within things. People don't seem to take him seriously all the time until he starts yeah. yelling and throwing his little fit there. Um, it's very interesting to see where he fits in here and there's clearly some sort of you're right there's something that's got in his head that he needs to overcome and it's very it's very i can't wait to learn more about it i'm instantly in that scene watching him be silent or barely say any words i'm like i'm in i am in i'm in it's, i need no more it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting for me because i feel like if if you were to say like i know that they're saying that andor is like one big film i feel like that this free episode arc is certainly a film in itself. Yeah. And to me, the, the message throughout this mini film is um, radicalization for every character, um, particularly out of the Andor that like you see, like what made him you know, the way he is, but also like you're saying with Cyril, this is a person who is, you know, behind the scenes a lot, has a certain set of ideas that get, pushed further or more radicalized add a little bit of burn in them through his experiences and you know seeing the bodies burn and seeing the this this act of this horrible terrorist um and that is what's interesting to me the most about this series is that it delves into the idea of you know the uneasy truth is that fascism is very sly and it's it's a state of mind it, it's, it's a situation it's a experience that is allowed through inaction more so than it is just by right wing or um very aggressive enablers so you have people like cyril who are clearly being indoctrinated by their own bs and then seeing the stuff in action and let's push them further and then you have people like the superintendent who is just indifferent to the situation he's they've they've accepted the empire because it lets them flourish and you see it a lot and that's what i love about these imperial characters because you have either all you have the people that just went along with it either because they feel like it's the right thing to do and then sometimes they realize it's not and they join the rebellion or you have some that just gain from it and that's what they care about and so you see them you know rise up the ranks very much like krennic and then you have people that genuinely believe in it. And they're the real people that you have to look out for. They're the ones that, you know, they're pushing for the, the darker stuff, the darker fascist side of stuff. And depressingly, you see that in real life. You see people, situations that, you know, people who are very aggressive and speak to a certain set of people who believe this stuff. And then they get impassioned by what they perceive to be the truth or along those lines we know and or we know his backstory we know that he's been for a lot we know that you know he's escaping and stuff but to, from a serious point of view this is a man who's murdered many people he's caused explosions he's created carnage he's a terrorist he's blah, blah, blah. and that's what's interesting is the is the debate around that and the the fighting and the you know the views of all these different characters and i think that's what's interesting to me the most um and also fiona shaw's call well and, yeah. <laughs> well, and to your point of like how it mirrors stuff going on in the real world, I think that like one of the moments in this first few episodes that like sort of hit me the strongest is when everybody 
on Ferrix just starts like, oh, the cops are here. Like these like enforcers are here and they all just start making a ruckus and like the unity there to like mm-hmm. defend their home and be like, fuck you, you're outsiders. Like get out of here. Like we're taking care of each other. Like you just, we meet all these like individual people that maybe we only meet for a second. Like the guy who and or borrows the ship from or vetch and his buddy (laughs) you know like we meet or the guys working at the repair shop we meet all these characters just for like a moment and they're all named by the way they're all named characters i don't know them but they fleshed out this world so that when that it does lead up so well it builds that suspense so well so that in episode three when the whole town like comes together to like shake it up and like really defend it it's just like that is what you need to defend against fascist regimes is like you have to band together as a community and take care of each other and so like even within like people calling it like really dark or gloomy and like yes it has that it has a brothel it had two (laughs) like murders in the first scene it has all this like really dark stuff in it but it also like that moment for me was like pure hope and pure like positive energy and like a solution for the problems that they're facing and like so that to me was like the most profound thing in the whole thing and when the drums hit at the end of the episode too because i lost my shit walking as he's walking to the beat of that and it's It's and it's so true because so many people were saying that these that this was dark but honestly watching these i felt so hopeful that's exactly it it's just like i felt pumped up i felt like part of the rebellion there were a couple moments where of people looking out for each other cassian's friend who's asking no questions and he's going getting off of his shift and being like i was mad at your at you spurning my drink choice and then you had you fell and my and like creating this out no questions asked just people a mismatched group of people supporting each other. That's, and that was amazing. Like it felt so, he has this amazing network of people who look out for each other and care for each other. And I got chills. I kid you not, actual goosebumps on my arms when uh, Fiona Shaw's character is has the two uh, enforcer guys in her home. And she's like, what you really got to worry. Like that's this, that's this what a reckoning sounds like chills and also like what you really got to be worried for paraphrasing is when that sound stops I'm like what happens yeah. then you're like oh chills 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 all over the place oh that's even, so cold and dark yeah, yeah. But even that is a metaphor in itself like the idea of the drumming being this sign that symbolizes okay get to work you know it's time to get to work or it's time to stop work this is a very capitalist planet and situation. This is what you have to do. And it's turning the dime to fight against those who are basically enforcing you to to do that. I thought it was pretty pretty bloody cool. Um and yeah, like the armed forces, like these these guys who think they're like badass soldiers and they're actually just like security guards that have a really good budget. Um I yeah. think it was Molly <laughs> Damon uh, on on uh, the Star Wars Explained show who said my favorite like comparison, which is they're very much all Dwight Schrute's, like in the in like the uh, not police outfit, but the like off duty like police outfit. It's very much that or, like, volunteer, yeah. Paul Bart, Mall Cop is what I like to call them when I was Mall watching cop. it. Mall Cop. Well, I saw someone. I saw someone compare Cyril's pep talk. It was sort of the antithesis of. Uh, Greyjoys, Theon Greyjoys from oh, uh, God, Game of yeah. Thrones, where <laughs> you know he ge- in that in that he gives like a pretty rousing speech, but they all know he's an idiot, so they just like knock him out. Yeah. And this one, he gives, well, he's upstaged by his second in command, who like delivers <laughs> all the information he needs, and then he just bungles it. It is so <laughs> bad, and you're sitting there, and I'm just cringing. I feel bad for this guy in this oh, moment because no. clearly he cares but he has no field experience he has he's never been on the ground and led these missions and then you know they go with, along with it because like they're like okay whatever we're getting paid but we're not doing this because we like this guy's charisma 
right. or anything. So <laughs> I also really enjoyed the use of um, classism for the for the galaxy, like especially, particularly in the UK, like you know, accent and your voice is very much associated with your class in certain cases mm-hmm. because the way we look at look down on people. And mm-hmm. I felt like a lot of the uh, the lower grunts of the force had a very you know northern accent. Um, even the second in command, like obviously, he's, he's Scottish. Um, yeah, woo! Shout to very, shout very to Scottish. Actor. Shout <laughs> yeah. to the actor who, um, marvelous. He was, Bat- he was in the Batman this year, he was the commissioner, but he was also, um, oh. Trevor from EastEnders. Who I'm telling you, um, in the UK, we have a soap called EastEnders, and um, there's a character called Lil Mo, and she had a very abusive husband, really horrible villain, like. He's like one of the, I think he was like voted like top villain of the year. Like he was horrible. That's was what him. I aspire to actor. win is top villain of the year. Well, it's funny for me because as a like person who watches EastEnders and grew up in that era, there was a lot of naughty's EastEnders actors in this ep- in these episodes. Uh, notably, obviously Trevor playing the second in command, but uh, the actor who played um, Patrick Truman on EastEnders. Is Cassian's dad or stepdad, um, uh, Maeve's partner? Mm, okay, which yeah. is really cool. I was like, hey, it's like a full EastEnders reunion. So really cool to see a lot of British talent out there. But yeah, the voices thing it was interesting. Obviously, you got this like um, upper class, like American, and you know, um, business guy, and then you got all these like northern grunts. Be like, okay, yeah, all right. You think you know? <laughs> Chill out. I forget if I think it's in one of the books where they talk about that, like explicitly about the different voices. Maybe it's in one of the audio dramas. I, I remember listening to a book on tape and hearing Mark Thompson's voice talk about, you know, in this galaxy, you know, people from the outer rim have sort of a southern drawl to the way that they speak, mm-hmm. whereas the people in the inner core speak very, you know, proper and whatever. And so there is totally oh, that, you. like. Right, exactly. So you, there is totally that going on, and I, mm-hmm. I like to see that, like that they've carried that over for sure. Yeah, it was just really cool, like to see even guys like Tim and stuff. Just you know, Tim. Tim. Oh, can, we talk, can we talk about Tim for a bit? Oh, Tim. 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 Tim, the Tim, Tim, Tim. Tim with an I and an M, but more than you think. <laughs> but more than you think. Uh, <laughs> A character oh, who very much feels like we've all got that one neighbor. We've all got one neighbor that's like Tim. You won't trust them. You you know you certainly don't want them to ring the cops because um, they will. Mm-hmm. Just so what? insecure yeah. as well. Like he is having relations with Bix, who is an absolute knockout in every sense of the word. Fifteen out of ten. 15 out of 10 at least. Oh my God. Every time she's on screen, I'm like, I love you. I will find she, all of the like, crap parts, please. <laughs> exactly. She's entrepreneurial. She knows how to fix stuff. She mm-hmm. clearly like no can handle herself on the black market. Like, and you know, but he's still, even though he's like in a quasi relationship with her, he's like so insecure about, and or being around and being in the picture to the point where he, you know, gets a little too fucked up and goes over to the the space phone booths, which I thought were really cool. Yes! Well. Thank you, Thank you for booth. bringing that up. That is something I want to talk about. I'm actually very angry at loads of journalists who kept bringing up the sex thing as if that was a big issue. Like, um, oh my God, it's oh. the first sex scene in Star Wars. This is incredible. Wait, are you telling me that people in a relationship fuck? Yeah, but get they kept talking like, oh my you god. You gotta fool me! Sex in Star Wars. Like, it's amazing crazy. that and I'm over all here of these being people like, exist, so I'm, something had I'm to over happen. Here thinking, I don't give a shit about sex. Look at these cool phone booths. It's the first time <laughs> I've seen a phone booth in Star Wars. We know your priorities, Charlie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I hope they have like, you know, like if, it, if it's like London, I hope there's like those pit like stickers of like uh, naked Twilight girls and stuff. Like, cool, Ula, <laughs> <laughs> for a fun time. Um, oh my goodness! I think we can agree that the message of Tim's character arc 
is that snitches get stitches, right? Facts. Like facts. That was horrifying, that though. Like it was. It was terrifying. Yeah. Even though we hate Tim, that uh, you know the look on Bix's face, like and not being able to move and being forced to basically stare at. That's what I was saying mm-hmm. earlier. Like all the whole episode was about different, um, you know, people getting pushed into this, you know, action. You can't just be on one side. You gotta, you, you gotta pick a side, or you're forced to pick a side. Yeah, and you're being, you know rolled up and you saw her face like she's she's in the she's in the rebellion now like you just yeah. like that it's the same with luke and when he sees uh, uh, baru and owen it's that turn yeah that's a great yeah a great mirror mm-hmm. she had one toe in it obviously she has connections but yeah i think we're about to jump head first into the deep end and it's so and like going off of like one of the first things that i that i mentioned really loving about this show tim in his mind did the right thing there's a fugitive you know who the fugitive is you turn the fugitive into authorities because they broke the law and supposedly killed somebody in his mind he's doing the right thing also it's a dangerous man and the woman around the woman he loves clearly he like i've dated that guy though i've dated that guy that tim the one who's like (laughs) who oversteps their boundaries because they think they know what's best for you or they think somebody, you know, is like some guy is like creeping on you who's actually just your friend and you're having a completely normal conversation and overstep. Like, we know that guy. Everybody knows that guy. Come on. Like, that's – I've dated that guy. And in their mind, they're doing the right thing trying to protect her. You know, it's it's, it's him trying to do the right thing. And – Simple he conversation clearly, he, would have fixed yeah. it, but you know, whatever. He also, you can tell he's struggling with it. I mean, he does like have to get pretty pissed at the bar to go and actually follow through with it. So you know, he he grapples with it, and I think part of it is also jealousy. He's super, you know, jealous and insecure, yeah, insecure yeah. about it. And then I don't, we didn't unfortunately get enough time with him to understand like what his position to the empire or to this corporation was i think that would have been cool to get but yeah. you know he made his choice and he <laughs> paid for it in the end it's interesting as well because this is bring the show brings up interesting dilemmas that you have to really face and think about which is if you were in that position obviously from a rad- like from a reasonable point of view if you're thinking about this from an outside point of view you've got all the context if he doesn't tell her what, like he she, he had the opportunity to tell her when she came to his house, yeah. But then you also have to weigh that up with the fact that you get to, uh, you know, hit that booty, and so you have to like weigh that up. Like, do you do you hit the booty or do you betray the trust? And it's difficult <laughs> because sometimes you really want to tap that. And um, why have a hard conversation when instead we can just do it? You can have something else that hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, and, and and she also, like, I'm sure he felt in that moment pretty upset because Bix kept telling him, told him three times throughout the course of these episodes, oh, I'm heading out, like, don't wait up for me, or, like, I can't make our date, or, like, I gotta, can you open the shop because I've got errands to run. So he doesn't know what those are. He doesn't know that, like, that's a legit side thing and it doesn't have to do with, him, but it just falls back on his insecurities again and yep. and yes obviously if she comes over it's like i'm pretty sure that's the fr- the first booty call we've gotten in star wars like late night booty call mm. um but you love to see it you do love to finally see it. you love to see it <laughs> right that into is Lucas keeping it moist so many years. and or version please we need to see booty calls you know represented in star wars we just need to see it <laughs> next we need space tinder Y'all get get space tinder on later in the series. We're gonna make it happen. I think it's, it's inevitable, just... Claire. I think it's coming. Yes. I think space tinder is just like the the bounty hunter booths. That'd be a fun story. What if there's like yep. someone puts a bounty hunter booth next to a tinder booth, and then they get confused. <laughs> so there's a bounty hunter trying to like, <laughs> you know track down. Trying to smash That's that grim. booty. Yeah. Love it. Um, but yeah, I very much 
love it gives a whole new meaning to body count (laughs) 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 yeah the the scratches on rex's helmet aren't bow droid kills oh oh dear got another one sir (laughs) (laughs) um that's why they respect yeah. him so much. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> Rex Come can on. get it any day. <laughs> um, yeah, but I really just enjoy the way we're delving into these characters. We haven't even really talked about Ant like Cassian that much, really. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's just yeah, I love seeing his backstory for once, and a lot of references to the Rogue One visual guide, which was really cool. It's yeah. funny, like I do believe that sometimes we take people's comments and overblow them a little bit particularly the gilroy comments that obviously he's a he's an amazing author and i really do respect him when he says like you know i don't want you to be over like i don't want you to be overridden by your love for star wars i want you to just focus on what makes the story great because ultimately that's what this matter that's what matters really and i do appreciate and love that but i do feel like it's been overblown a tiny bit because i saw a lot of people saying Wow, I watched this episode. It's like it. It sometimes it didn't really feel like Star Wars. I'm like, there's a fucking droid about two minutes in it, like going beep <laughs> Like shut the fuck up, you dork. It's <laughs> yeah. absolutely Star Wars, and that doesn't mean it can have different vibes, different feelings, or different. You know, you know, it just have to all be one thing. That's the point. Yeah. But also, it, and that's what's going to keep Star Wars going. Star Wars. <laughs> If you if you watch this and for any moment for this doesn't feel like Star Wars, I'm like, what are you watching? I'm like exactly, like, what? The sandwich doesn't feel like Star Wars. Like, wait, what the fuck? Are you about? <laughs> Just watch the thing. Um, so yeah, that that was frustrating, but I really did enjoy the the love and depth to the to the universe. Because even though for me, it just feels like these concepts and ideas have existed already but for tony gilroy it's like okay we're going to be doing these story beats and then the lucasfilm story group or whatever go that's great we can use this that already exists and blend it into that and or just you know replace this word with this word and it fits and that's what's great about it you see stuff like um you know just all these different elements of like the separatists and you know the republic are up to stuff um the Venator ship being cut down was great. I love seeing that. Um, the Y Wing, yeah. which is you know really cool to see a, a live action yeah. Y Wing in a like just a quick shot. Um, Ochi Bastoon ship makes an appearance, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, oh, I didn't catch that. Wait, really? Bastoon's legacy. I didn't catch yeah. that either. The yeah. Bastoon legacy is it just sitting in the junkyard? Yeah, or at least another ship that's like that. But yeah, it, it looks pretty cool. Um, oh, the oh, best dude, love that guy. <laughs> the best guy in the world. Or, or even like the reference to Fest, which is like where, yeah. like that insight. Like I think you you mentioned it, but like he's told everybody that he's from Fest, so that's what the reference book said. But they gave us like a brilliant in-universe reason for why. That may not be true. And it's just like, you can tell that it is like a perfect synergy between someone who's just a great writer of storytelling, particularly this sort of spy thriller drama long form thing and the story group. It's like probably some of the best synergy I've seen from those two camps Mm. so far in the like modern Disney era. And it's really, really cool. And clearly, you know, Gilroy is fine with it too. He's fine. Like, Oh yeah, I don't get, care what you call it. <laughs> just like this is what the story is, and yeah, make it, it make it fit. It doesn't override that. Like no, obviously you could write a script that says, "Can you make me a cup of coffee?" and then change it to, "Can you make me a cat?" He's not gonna right. go, "Okay, cut this. I'm gonna leave the <laughs> dick." Like it, it doesn't matter. Like it, it's the tone, it's the intent, it's the context. It's is that what creative differences means? disagreeing yeah. over coffee versus calf like i can't we have to call this a share otherwise i'm leaving i'm not going to, <laughs> i'm not calling it anything else okay i'm gonna go um yeah i think it's just interesting to see how what people 
I don't know, make art was about. I don't think that's the point. I yeah. feel like if you're going into this this show and you're delving into these themes, which are so intriguing and interesting, and I love them so much, and you come out saying, first sex scene in Star Wars. You should make a piece about that. Like, wow, yep. how the fuck do I... Did they watch Revenge of the Sith and get really confused when Padme came out of a fucking big belly? Whoa! What happened there? <laughs> What's going on? What happened? Second, it wouldn't be the first time, Charlie. I mean, where's Anakin's dad at? This is an immaculate conception universe. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> the, I, the IMCU. <laughs> oh, goodness. The Can we talk about the Canari, the Canari oh, stuff? Oh, goodness. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I just thought that that was so cool. Please. I, I like, when that first scene came on, I was like, okay, there's no subtitles. I don't have subtitles on. Do I need to have them on? Because I can't, I can't understand what they're saying, but I'm not, like, I watched the first couple scenes and I was like, am I supposed to be understanding what they're saying? Because I, I get it. They don't need them, but I, like, literally played and paused it and, like, put on, like, the subtitles for a second and it just says, speaking Canari. Which I love that they went for that. I love that they didn't give us the subtitles because those kids, that village of children, clearly there's like a really terrible story there that I hope they get to. But that we don't need to know the specifics of what they're saying to understand what they're going through and what they're talking about. And so I just, I love it. It was pretty brave to do that, I think. And I love yeah. it. I love it because we are also so accustomed to having the subtitles for different languages in star wars we're so yeah. accustomed to having that be the case and i love that this is like hi this is a human story this is a story about humanity this is a story about people that are different than you and you being able to empathize with them even if you can't understand them watch it i loved that they didn't include subtitles and yeah. i always keep my subtitles on because i don't i don't I don't hear things as well as maybe I should. I don't get words. They always sound more mumbly than me than than to other people. But when I saw that as well, I was like, Let's see what you're doing here. And I dig it. I really appreciate I, I appreciate that they did do that. Yeah. And I knew it would annoy I, people I, though. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it because it is also a thematic idea and the storytelling, which is that this is a different culture. And actually, we're watching this. That we're watching those Canary scenes from the view of the galaxy in general, the Star Wars universe as we know it so far, and also just in terms of like the imperialistic, um, you know, the Republic. You know, who I thought it was interesting. Obviously, you know, they're not a Republic planet. They're not a Separatist planet so far that we know of. And you know, the outsiders we just don't think about their culture, so we don't really need to know what they're talking about. And that's what came across to me. I was like, oh, okay. That's how we're doing it. It's really interesting for me. Like, I really like that. Like, the way we treat people who are different. Like, this is a whole civilization with their own culture, their own language. And just because we don't know what they're saying, some well, of us, you know. And Diego Luna even told, said this a couple of times, that it's sort of a story about immigrants. And mm. you can feel that in these first three episodes i mean from these kids who are on this planet who like every character that you hear say the word canary the word canary comes up everybody's like oh who what the hell is canary like where who would be from there that backwater planet you know and then the same like the way that they interact with the law enforcement in this show i mean it is not being subtle it's like this is a story about immigrants and finding your place in the galaxy and you know it's it's beautiful and i'm excited to see where it goes from there i hope we are not leaving ferrix behind i don't think we are but i hope they come back and sort of have some more conversations about that kind of stuff because i totally agree it also deals with like the trivialization of different cultures the way a lot of you know especially if you're like me you're british you go into these places that we've ravaged or destroyed and affected, and then you sort of trivialize them later on. Like, oh, isn't this silly? Isn't this funny? Isn't this part of culture? And then you look at our culture and we do like certain things, like, I don't know, like very recently, and you look at it from outside of you and think, that's okay, it's very weird. And 
you know, it's the same thing with this. It's the idea that you, they literally trivialize these people, like to the extent of the Qatari girl who are, we believe is Cassian's sister is kind of marketed as this prostitute who is, oh, look, she's a Qatari. Want to go with the Qatari woman? Isn't that a bit unique? Like, like it's a, yeah. like a dirty exotic category on some weird, yeah. It's yeah, just, fetishizes they them use almost. that nasty word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was really intriguing. And yeah, like you said, like it, it delves into the way we, you know, we do that. Like the, the, the Empire is fundamentally a, a mixture of different real life cultures and situations and ideas and concepts. But you see that a lot. Again, this all reflects stuff that happens in the real world and it's not been dealt with really fully yet in the real world either. And it's interesting to see that reflect in the media and yeah, interesting. So overall, if you were to rank these episodes. I hate it. So far. <laughs> what would you give it? I mean, again, and also ranking doesn't mean anything <laughs> really doesn't mean anything. It's just, we just do this for fun. Um, if, if you don't want to, you can refuse to do it. I don't care. Um, but what, what would you give it? What is our what is our scale we're using? Oh, usually we come up for scale. Let's say Claire, have you got any ideas? Scale scales, putty scales we can do. Man, I don't know. Oh no. Oh no. Uh. We've got to come up with something. I missed our Lulas, so we need to find something that we get attached to in this show and, and for future ones, make sure it's out of that. How many blanks mm. out of blank? Or we attached to, to but out of 10 bitch. what's? Out of 10 bits. Tims. How many Tims? <laughs> One to Bix. Oh. One to Bix. How many Tims? How many M's on the, on the word Tim? <laughs> on one to Bix because Bix is a 10 that is true yeah. <laughs> perfect perfect okay you go, first. Claire, you go first well on a scale of one to Bix <laughs> um, on a scale of one to Bix I would have to give it a uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd give it's. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rate these individually I don't no. think that you know I don't think that's fair because um, obviously I enjoy enjoyed the third more so than the first two because that is the climactic part in the story that's one cohesive unit that all three parts make up um but i'm gonna give it an eight and a half out of out of bix um <laughs> so yeah i really i i'm really excited i feel like this series is gonna grow from this point as well so i need to give myself a little room for growth but i am obsessed i've been waiting for this series rogue one is my number one disney star war um, and Cassian was my favorite character to come out of Rogue One. So when they announced this show, I flipped out. This is, I've been waiting for this. And I love Diego Luna. I love him and everything he does. And I'm fascinated to see how he becomes the man that we see in Rogue One. And, and it's a man who now is so lost and without a home, without a without a real purpose, other than I want to find my sister, um, he's about to find a purpose and join a cause and organize. And I'm so excited to see where these next episodes go because this has established an amazing base for where we're going to go. So I'm going to say eight and a half out of Bix. Um, and I can't believe how freaking excellent the start to the show has been just amazing sean yeah i uh i think for a similar reason i'm gonna go for eight out of bix um i also thought it was incredible this is a show that you know they announced it i loved rogue one i think especially like i, I don't know that's one of my favorite disney era movies probably top two or three um great film so i knew that like production wise it was going to be great but i didn't really i wasn't it wasn't the one that i would pin to the calendar and be like that's the one i'm most excited for but when that trailer hit during celebration and i think it was the uh 
what's the bell guy? The time grappler. When he starts banging on that thing mm -hmm. and it just sets the tone for Ooh. that trailer. <laughs> yeah. I we mean, didn't it talk was, about him. We Can didn't we talk just... about the time grappler. But that, like, he loves his job. That's a man who loves his job. And he knows how to set a mood for the work day or for like closing Oof. time. Like, you know, that song yeah. closing time. I would much prefer to listen to this dude, just bang it out on those, on those, on those bells. Um, but this show, I mean, yeah, I, I'm super excited for where it's going. I am very glad that they dropped the first three episodes at once because I think honestly, it just saved us a lot of grief on the internet for the first two weeks um stupid conversations about its pacing i'm not really seeing too many complaints about that now i mean it's an, an acknowledgement that it's a slow burn but it's not a complaint so i i think that that was a great move and it it's yeah i'm like, super excited to see where it leads i think that especially the ramp up to that final episode from the whole community coming together to bang on the drums to like luthan we didn't talk about luthan either and stellan skarsgård but when he delivers that line and he's like, don't you want to fight these bastards for real? That got me pumped. Like, I want to see them fight this. And I want to see Cassian, like, build up that passion to fight the Empire in any shape or form. Because that expression, you know, don't you want to fight these bastards for real? is something that, like, I've had as, like, an internal monologue for... A few years, you know, as we've seen the rise of fascism all over the globe, I'm like, can we just fight these fuckers for real, please? Like, <laughs> we need to do something and we need to like come together and stop this stuff. So I'm super, super excited for the trajectory that this show is on. And I can't wait till next week. I've heard episode four from people who've seen it is like even better somehow. I'm super excited to see Mon Mothma enter the picture and <laughs> Saul somehow. and who knows how else. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Yeah. I can't believe we didn't talk about Lufin, but for me, <laughs> there's so much, the there's so much yeah, to say. There's so much for me, that character is really interesting and really great to delve into. And like you were saying, and like, how do we fight these, these bastards? And the interesting thing about the rebellion in this time period is that it's like an explosion. It's like a powder keg. That is exploding at different points. And it's the way that we try to choose to control the explosion. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got their yeah. own little idea of how that should be done. And that's what's intriguing and complicated about this period is the way that Luthan wants to control it or like channel that energy. There's the way that Mom Mothman wants to do it with like the Senate and, you know, through the wall, the system as is. And then you got people like Saw who are just, you know, they've been burnt for so long. Yeah. And the powder cakes get hotter and hotter. So for me, I'm really intrigued to see how far they go with it and how much depth they're going to it. But yeah, we also need to understand that the rebellion isn't perfect yet. Or ever will be, really. Um, and the way that Cassian does, you know, he becomes this character who we know, but he's he's not in a great place at the beginning of Rogue One. Um and so, yeah, it's like, how do we get to that point? And that's what's intriguing to me. Uh, but I think that's what we've got time for this week, uh, for this first episode. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for coming on. You're thank you for welcome. having me, guys. You're always welcome to come back on in the future. But where can people find you and your content? Yeah, so I just started a podcast, um, just kicked off last month. We've only got five episodes so far, but uh, super excited. We're doing a weekly show reviewing Andor called Ander Candor, which, you know, thank you, Stellan Skarsgård, for pronouncing Andor that way. So my rhyme works. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, but you can find us on Instagram and Twitter <laughs> at Bogus Cantina. You can also find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And you can find me at uh, shroom underscore e on Instagram and on Twitter at Room Sean. Fantastic. Uh, Claire, it's great to be back doing this again. It's been a little while since we've done anything like this. So, you know, we've got to shake off the nerves, shake off that energy, get back into the into the set. And what a great way to start this. Um, where can people find you, Claire? Definitely. It definitely has been. And it's been fun. It's good to be back. 
and uh, discussing brand new Star Wars television. And but uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and the Tick and Talk at C Stribs. Um, that's mainly where you can can find a lot of stuff. We also are on TikTok. The Imperial Senate is. I know it doesn't say that on our banner, but we'll update that. Um, we're at the Imperial Senate podcast on TikTok. There's a lot of fun Star Wars related TikToks as well as snippets from reaction videos and stuff are all going to go up there. Um, so pay attention to that space. We are also doing and or reactions. I'm not sure if they're going to be up by the time that this is posted, but um, keep an eye out for that. On the subject of reactions, um, I know everybody really responded super well and adored the addition of Mel to the Kenobi reactions. Um, I am not reacting with Mel. She's in a bit of a tough spot right now, so I wanted to also take a moment to plug this as well. Um, Mel's been in the hospital for the past week. She's experiencing some lung issues, and things are pretty pretty intense. Um, we want to make sure, like us at the Imperial Senate podcast, we decided to put together a GoFundMe because, you know, uh, there's that. The link to this GoFundMe will be in the episode description so um, even if it's $2, $5, um, whatever you're comfortable sharing, if, if you miss Mel and you want her to get better and get back, please uh, consider donating and, or sharing because um, I miss her dearly. She really is a super special part of my life and, and, our, and our podcast now as well. So um, just to help her worry about getting healthy and have less to worry about the bills. We, If you have it in your heart, please consider donating that because we love her and we miss her. And Anyway, I'm going to cry, so go on. We love Darling, you, Mel. Sorry. Yeah, Mel is the best. Um, she's one of those people mm -hmm. that as soon as you meet them, you know that they're, they're good stock. They're good people and you're going to be friends with them. Yeah. So please do donate if you can. Um, and hopefully we'll get to see her do more stuff. With you, Claire, I on the channel. So. She was going to do the Andor reactions with me, and she's really upset that she wasn't able to do them. Um, yeah, but her health comes but, first. Because Star yeah, Wars and hopefully, up. yeah. So hopefully, eventually, she'll come back. We'll have her all healed up and ready to to react like a Muppet, like me, and um, and to do some reactions to the Clone Wars coming to YouTube near you. When she's better. So well, no one really cares about the Clone Wars. No one really likes it. So um, let's wrap. <laughs> I like how it's stuck on Claire's just face of like. Um... <laughs> Good. Come on. I'm glad. It's, we have fun <laughs> here. Um, of course, you can follow me on Twitter at cmwashby. On Instagram, I'm Charlie M W Ashby. And I've got a lot of stuff in the fire that I'm hoping to get to at some point. Not right now, but you'll see more. You can see my link, uh, my link tree on Twitter. There's links to stuff there. But yeah, most importantly, please do donate to our little GoFundMe for Mel. And yeah, that's all we've got time for this week. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you're listening to our show feed. Uh, please follow Sean's podcast. It's great. Been having back on for more. Woo, focus next time, woo, 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 woo. Until next time. See ya. Bye. See ya.